The curved arrow formalism is probably the most important convention in all of organic chemistry. It's used to depict electronic movement in both resonance and chemical reactions. And it's important because it has an underlying meaning that transcends just the movement of electrons that's related to molecular orbital theory and ideas. But in this lesson, I want to focus just on the nature of the curved arrow formalism itself, what it means, how we apply it to reaction mechanisms, and what it can tell us to an extent about how we should expect an organic reaction to proceed. My goal moving forward is to set you up for overlaying an understanding of orbital theory on top of your understanding of the curved arrow formalism. We'll see that what curved arrows really represent in a physical sense are orbital interactions, but for now, keep in mind that curved arrows imply very specific and concrete things about how electrons move between atoms and how formal charge and valence electron count change within the building blocks. Curved arrows show the movement of electrons from a source to a sink. More specifically though, they show either the formation or the cleavage of covalent bonds. And this is an important concept to remember that every curved arrow is going to indicate either the formation or the cleavage of a covalent bond. Let's look at the curved arrow formalism in the context of two sort of prototypical examples. The first is an example of what I call external electron flow between two completely distinct molecular entities, I guess you could say, a lone pair on an atom X and a carbocation. A curved arrow in this context might look something like this, and what the curved arrow is showing is the formation of a new single bond between the atom X, which is the electron source, and the electron sink, which is in this case the carbocation. Now this shows the formation of a new single bond between the source and the sink. Curved arrows can also show the formation or cleavage of double and triple bonds. So to give you an example of that, let's take a hypothetical pi bond, xy, and again the carbocation as the electron sink. Here with the pi bond as the electron source, we are showing the cleavage, actually, of the XY double bond and the formation of a new single bond to the carbocation. One more example showing the formation of a pi bond might be something like this. An atom X connected to a carbon which is connected to an atom Y and X bears on it a lone pair. So here again the source is the non-bonding lone pair and the sink is the sigma star orbital of the carbon Y bond. The second curved arrow in this case is showing the cleavage of that carbon Y bond. That's how we know that the sink is sigma star. The resulting products, a new double bond between X and carbon, and then the atom Y, which has dissociated itself from that central carbon atom. Now there's one important ingredient we're missing in all three of these examples, and that is the concept of formal charge. Conservation of charge is as true now as it was when you learned it in general chemistry or even before. And so the products need to have the same formal charge in sum as the left-hand side. In the first two examples, we have formal charge of plus one overall on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we need those charges to show up. Well, the key point here from the perspective of the curved arrow formalism is that every time you use a double-headed arrow to show the movement of two electrons, the source increases its formal charge by one. In the first example, notice what, the, what happens to the valence electron count on the source X before and after the step. Before the step, X, ignoring everything else, has just a valence electron count of two. But after the step, now that its lone pair is part of a new single bond, its valence electron count has decreased to one. On the whole, its formal charge has increased by one, and so it's gone from neutral to positively charged. In the second example, the atom X has gone from a valence electron count of 2 to a VEC of 1 in the product. And so the source atom here has increased its formal charge by 1 and it's now positively charged. Notice that Y, which is the actual atom that formed the new bond, has not changed. And so overall, if we treat the entire double bond as the source, its formal charge has increased by 1 
X has increased by 1, Y hasn't changed, and so the total is still an increase of plus 1. What happens to the electron sink? Well, in both of these examples, we can notice that the sink's charge decreases by 1, and that's because the valence electron count of the sink actually goes up when it inherits electrons. So at the start, the VEC in both of these examples is 3, and when all is said and done at the end, the VEC of that central carbon atom is now 4. So it's inherited one more electron, its formal charge has decreased by one unit. To apply both of these ideas to the last example, we can see that the atom Y has inherited a lone pair, and the atom X has converted a lone pair to a bond, and so its charge has increased by one, and the charge on the sink has decreased by one from neutral to negatively charged. So the curved arrow formalism implies very specific changes in valence electron count and formal charge on the building blocks that are associated with it. Keeping in mind the concept of valence electron count and formal charge alongside the curved arrow formalism can help you make sure that you're drawing the correct products from a given set of curved arrows or a set of curved arrows that you've drawn yourself.